But we're here in chapter 24, and what we're going to be looking at is uh, the 24th chapter. I've chosen to entitle this installment of our study, uh, I Have Done Foolishly, and you're going to see why I say that in just a moment. But what we'll do is we'll begin with verse 1. I'll read just verse 1 and give you a background, some information, context, and we'll move into our study. 2 Samuel chapter 24, verse 1. Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel, and he moved David against them to say, Go number Israel and Judah. Now, notice how it says, Again, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. Just a few chapters before, in chapter 21, God had been angry at the nation of Israel over something that King, King Saul had done. King Saul had actually killed some Gibeonites, and God was upset about it to the degree that he had brought uh, famine and drought on the land for a space of three years. What we have here in chapter 24 is just a, a, a statement that once again the Lord's anger is against Israel. But it doesn't say why he was angry. Just that God ang got angered over something that had occurred. Now what is interesting as we begin, I want you to see this, is notice how it says in verse 1, the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel and he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. He's saying, go and take a census, and we're going to see in just a moment that it was a census of all, of all the military, all the fighting men that were capable of, of uh, wielding a sword and, and entering into military combat. But it's the Lord who, who moves him, because that's what it says in verse 1. He moved David against them. What's interesting is when you look at First Chronicles, which is a companion to this, First Chronicles chapter 21, verse 1, it says there that, Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. On one hand, chapter 24, verse 1 of 2 Samuel says, God moved David. But on the other hand, the writer of Chronicles in 1 Chronicles 21 says that Satan stood up. So the question obviously is, right off the bat, is this a contradiction? Is this a contradiction in Scripture where one writer says God moved him and the other writer says, no, it was Satan. And so is that an error that you find in Scripture? The answer is, I don't know, let's just keep reading. No, uh, I'll give you an answer. What we have here is God moving David to perform his will and Satan using this against David. That's what you see. God is angry at Israel. He's going to judge the nation for an unspecified sin. So he moves David to take a census, but Satan uses this to move against the nation of Israel. God had said in verse 1, go number Israel and Judah. In other words, take a census of the army. Determine Israel's military strength. A commentator by the name of J. Vernon McGee says that this is an encouragement to David, revealing a great army of support to him. But what takes place is Satan takes advantage of a weakness that he has discovered in David. It's very possible that David had pride and ambition within his heart. And this is something that is being taken advantage of by the enemy. You see, David has grown older. And as David has grown older, it is apparent that he began to trust in his military strength. That does occur when a warrior grows older. David has grown to be an older man now, and it is possible for him to see strength or power as a very important thing in his life. You see, as, as men grow older, that is something I think in general that men can deal with. Ladies don't necessarily deal with this kind of thing. Men certainly do or can. I would say most likely men in general do deal with aging in that way. David was a warrior from his youth up. David was a shepherd who had no fear dispatching any predator that might come to prey on, his, on the sheep that he was tending, his father's small flock of sheep. David would take whatever the uh, predator was and he would slay it with no concern. As a matter of fact, David said that to Saul when David was getting ready to battle with Goliath. So David, from his youth up, was a, was a mighty man. He was a, a man of valor. He had within him a heart of a warrior. And, and every man in this room, ladies, believe it or not, 
has within him this kind of heart, this kind of disposition. Men have warrior spirits. Now some are greater than others. Some are great warriors and others are less. But everyone has a certain point that you can't push him to. When you get him to that point, that spirit begins to reveal itself. It's a warrior spirit. There's a line that can't be crossed and most men are that way. Now some men are, are very much that way. Maybe a little oversensitive, that's true. But there is something within men that at a certain point everything has to stop or we're going to go into battle. That's how it works. If a man is uh, seeing somebody who is going to start hurting his wife, uh, uh, his girlfriend, one of his children, there's just something that goes off inside of that man and that warrior spirit comes out. David had a warrior spirit. And so from a young man to an older man, David was somebody who would respond with aggression. And he also had a tremendous following. The men of Israel loved him and followed him because he was truly a man's man. So for him, physical strength and being a combat vet was very important. But recently, as he had grown older, he was in battle. And a Philistine giant had seen that he had grown tired in battle and set out to dispatch David. He was going to kill David. David's nephew sees what's taking place and as we already read, uh, his nephew came to David's defense and when his nephew came and slew that giant, the men of Israel began to look at David and they said, should the light of Israel be quenched, you're not going to come with us into battle anymore. David has been a warrior and now he's basically being retired. And so there's something within him that is going to respond. There's something in him that when he's told, go and take a census, that, that as a man he might begin to think in terms of identification with these military men and a certain pride can come up beyond that and identification with them to the degree that he may now look at them as, as men who are going to take care of him in his need. And in doing that, there's something about ambition, there's something about pride, there's something about self-respect, there's something about him uh, admiring the physical strength, the identification of all of that, that the enemy sees as a weakness. And as the enemy sees that as a weakness, the enemy's going to use that against David. You see, it's possible for us to know what to do, but to simply fail to do what we know. And David knew that he should trust the Lord. As a matter of fact, he knew that God is his strength. When you read the Psalms, David on, on occasion would even say that. He wrote Psalm 20, verse 7, where he said, Some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. He wrote Psalm 44, verses 6 through 8. He said, I will not trust in my bow, nor shall my sword save me. You have saved us from our enemies and have put to shame those who hated us. In God we boast all day long and praise your name forever. And yet in his old age, he is now looking at his military strength and the enemy is going to use that against him. Satan takes advantage of the inclination of his heart and David succumbs to the temptation. And that's going to be something God has to deal with in David, and Satan knew that. You see, David wrote uh, 2 Samuel 22, verse 28, where David said, You, speaking to God, you will save the humble people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. And that's what's going to take place in the life of David. David is about to be brought down. Now it says in verse 2, The king said to Joab, the commander of the army who was with him, now go throughout all the tribes of Israel from Dan to Beersheba from north to south and count the people that I may know the number of the people. Joab said to the king, now may the Lord your God add to the people a hundred times more than there, there are and may the eyes of my Lord the king see it. But why does my Lord the king desire this thing? Nevertheless, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Therefore, Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to count the people of Israel. And they crossed over the Jordan and camped in Aror on the right side of the town which is in the midst of the ravine of Gad and toward Jazer. And they came to Gilead and to the land of Tatim Hadshi, also known as Ontario. And they came to Dan John and around to Sidon. And they came to the stronghold of Tyre and to all the cities of the Hivites and the Canaanites then they went out to south Judah as far as Beersheba. So when they had gone through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of the nine months and 20 days. 
Now notice as David is giving the command for the census to be taken, notice in verse 3 how David's general, Joab, not only his general but also his counselor, doesn't understand the purpose of such, such a thing. And he says, why does my lord the king desire this thing? That's a good question. That question should have caused David to, to pause before uh, moving on, but, but David didn't. David didn't seek the answer for that. He simply said, go out and do it. Now, as it says in verses 8 and 9, it took them nine months and 20 days to finish the task from the entire country. They took a military census. So ultimately, as they begin to combine, I want you to see this, they combine the, uh, the Israel and Judah, they end up with 1.3 million potential fighting men. 1.3 million military men. Now, that may not seem like much, but that's an immense army. That's a huge army of potential fighters. Uh, you see, today in Israel, Israel's population is uh, just a little over 7 million. And there are probably somewhere around 2.8 million who are fit for service. In, in 2008, Israel had 187,000 active and 408,000 inactive military personnel. Well, you can see that that's a huge amount of people by ancient standards, 1.3 million. And as, as they are counted up, uh, David receives the amount and they say you've got 1.3 million potential fighting men. Now after that's taken place, verse 10, David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant for I have done foolishly. David immediately is stricken. His heart condemns him. For almost 10 months, his conscience was asleep to this sin, but now it awakens. He's convicted. He sees the pride of his heart. He confesses his sin. And that was a wise thing to do. Proverbs 28, 13 says, He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. And so he confesses. Now as this is taking place here, and he's aware of it, verse 11 David arose in the morning. The word of the Lord came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and tell David. Thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose one of them for yourself, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him. He said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or shall you flee three months before your enemies while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days plague in your land? Now consider and see what answer I should take back to him who sent me. David, you have three choices. You have famine, enemies, or a plague. See, what we see taking place here right now is, is mercy mixed with judgment. God could have simply moved immediately to judge, but God chooses not to do that. So he gives to David the terrible responsibility of making a choice. He's saying, David, I'm leaving this up to you. There are three things that could happen. One of these three things will happen, but I'm going to leave it up to you to make the choice. And in doing so, what happens is David has now got the burden of having to choose the punishment for the nation. And that would be incredible, an incredible burden for him because he's responsible for this judgment. And so as this is said to him, verse 14, David said to Gad, I'm in great distress. Please let us fall into the hand of the Lord for his mercies are great, but do not let me fall into the hand of man. So David immediately makes his decision. I will take three days of plague directly from the hands of God because God is merciful. You see, in times of famine, the people would have gone to other countries to help, uh, for help seeking man's mercy from, from other men. In fleeing from their enemies, while the enemies could have been exceptionally cruel to them, so David says, I'm going to trust the Lord. God is merciful, and I'll just leave my, myself in his hands because God is a merciful God. It's like Lamentations 3.32 says, Though he causes grief, yet he will show compassion according to the multitude of his mercies. It's like what David said in Psalm 51.8, Make me to hear joy and gladness that the, Jones, uh, the bones you have broken may rejoice. So he knows that God is going to bring judgment, so he's going to cast his concern on the Lord so that God may show mercy to him in the midst of all of this. Well... Notice verse 15, the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. The angel 
according to verse 16, stretched out his hand over Jerusalem to destroy it. The Lord relented from the destruction and said to the angel who was destroying the people, it's enough. Now restrain your hand. The angel of the Lord was by the threshing floor of Barana the Jebusite. And David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned. I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Judgment began immediately. Seventy thousand die. David sees that the angel is about to smite Jerusalem and begins to cry out to the Lord. But I want you to see what happens here. Notice that David in verse 17 truly repented. I want you to see this. I want to look at this with you for just a moment. Notice what he says. He says, surely I have sinned. I have done wickedly. But these sheep, what have they done? Now the sign of true repentance is taking the responsibility for their actions. When you really do repent, you stop blaming other people. When you really do repent, you do not say it's your fault. You forced me to it. I'm only reacting to what you did in the first place. If you got saved, the way you got saved was by saying to God, it's my fault, it's my fault, it's my most grievous fault. I'm the one who's responsible. I did it. I sinned. I fell short. God forgive me. But if I run off and say, well, you know what? I've done bad things, but it's the way I was raised or I didn't have enough education or money or whatever. If I begin to find excuse, I'm really not repenting. I'm blame setting. I'm saying it's your fault. If, if these things were not part of my life, I wouldn't have done these things. And the fact is, is David is simply saying, I have done it. I sinned. Not only did I sin, but my sin affected somebody else. You never sin in a vacuum. You never sin in isolation. A person may think that they're sinning in isolation. It's nobody's getting hurt except for me if anybody gets hurt at all. But that's not the truth. Because if I sin, I don't only sin against God, but I also am going to have somebody else who's going to be injured by what I did. If I fall, if I fail, it's not just David Rosales who falls and fails. David is going to take down his family. If I fail, if I get into a severe sin and God begins to deal with me, my wife is going to be taken down in one way or another with me. My children are going to be affected with me. My grandchildren will be affected with me. This church will be affected with me. The Calvary Chapel movement will be affected with me. The church across the United States will be known, uh, be affected with me because my ministry goes across this nation. So it's not just David Rosales all by himself. And so I have to be aware of that. And, and David is saying this. He's saying, I have sinned. These people didn't, but these people, 70,000 of them were affected by what he did. 70,000. One of the wisest things that a person can do is take responsibility for their own actions. When I was growing up in my teen years, there was a, a singer. He's still out there, still doing music, Smokey Robinson. Some of you have heard him or studied him in ancient history in your high school class. <laughs> Smokey Robinson. And he had a song that was called Ooh, Baby, Baby. What a interesting title but that's the title ooh baby baby and 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 part of the um, the one of the lines in the songs uh, mistakes I know I've made a few but I'm only human and then he goes on to say the dumbest thing a man can say you've made mistakes too well, that's the dumbest thing man if you're having a fight with your wife you do not do that <laughs> if I said that to Marie if we were having a fight and I said yeah mistakes I've made a few I'm only human You've made mistakes too. She popped me in the side of the head, man. <laughs> that doesn't work. It's not, she would, she would rightfully say, we're not talking about me. We're talking about you. It's what you did. Now see, if I try and say, yeah, baby, but you know, you make mistakes too. I'm not repentant. I'm really not changing. There's no hope for me at that moment. It doesn't work. If I'm really saying I'm sorry, it's not going to be I'm sorry, but you made me do it. It's not one of those things. I'm sorry, but you know what? You contributed. Oh, by the way, you think you're perfect. You're not for perfect. You make mistakes too. I'll have nothing but problems. But if I say, you know what? I'm wrong. I was wrong. I am sorry. It's me. I did it. I hurt you. I am sorry. And it's not one of those, if I hurt you, it's a, I hurt you. Because sometimes we'll say, well, forgive me if I. It's not a matter of if. It's a matter of you did and when you get to that, you did. When you say, I am sorry for what I did, repentance is taking place. 
But when you say, oh, I'm sorry, but you know what? It was the extenuating circumstances. I've been working long hours or I'm tired or whatever, you know, and it just came out, you know, and I didn't mean to do that. That's all a bunch of excuses. And those whom we are apologizing to, whether it's a woman saying it to a man or a man saying it to a woman or a, a dad saying it to the kids or vice versa, you're just covering your own sin. I can still remember when one of my kids was a, a young, we were, they were young, they were uh, nine, ten years old, and I had gotten upset at them over something, and, and, and I just hadn't been fair with them. And, and I came into the room, and I spoke to my, 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 my child, and I said, I'm sorry. I want you to know I'm sorry for what I did. And I'll, I'll always remember what they said back. It's okay, Daddy. And I looked back and I said, it's not okay. It's never okay. It was wrong, and I'm sorry. It's never okay for me to be unfair to you. It was wrong, and I'm sorry. Because I don't believe that if you're really apologizing, you should get off that easy, frankly. I just don't. If I did something wrong, I am sorry I did something wrong, and this is what I did, and I am sorry for doing it. That's repentance. And David said, I've done this. But they didn't because his sin affected a nation. Others were hurt by it. We don't live in a vacuum. Our lives impact other people. And in the body of Christ, one person's sin can actually impact everybody else. You can't go out and party on Saturday and serve on Sunday and think it's not going to affect the church. That's not how it works. Our sin affects other people. And so David said, let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. Well, in verse 18, Gad came that day to David and said to him, go up, erect an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Aruna's, Aruna the Jebusite. So David, according to the word of Gad, went up as the Lord commanded. Now, Urana looked and saw the king and his servants coming toward him. So Arana went out and bowed before the king with his face to the ground. Then Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy the threshing floor from you, to build an altar to the Lord, that the plague may be withdrawn from the people. Now Arana said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up whatever seems good to him. Look. Here are the oxen for burnt sacrifice and threshing implements and the yokes of the oxen for wood. All these, O king, Arana has given to the king. And Arana said to the king, May the Lord your God accept you. Then the king said to Arana, No, but I will surely buy it from you for a price. Nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for 50 shekels of silver, and David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offering and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land, and the plague was withdrawn from Israel. So Rhonda simply wants to show generosity to David. He offers to give him what he needs for the sacrifice. But I want you to notice David's response in verse 24. He says, I will surely buy it from you for a price. Now, according to 1 Chronicles 21, 24, he paid full price for it. He's saying, I'm not going to offer to the Lord a burnt offering that costs me nothing. So David's faith is revealed by his unwillingness to give to the Lord something that did not have value. Though David was paying Arana, the price was actually part of his offering that he was making to God. And had David accepted Arana's offer, it would have been Arana's offering and not David's. So let me give you something very practical at this point. In his action, David is revealing something. David is revealing that sacrifice is an essential part of love and service to God. Sacrifice is an essential part of our love and our service to the Lord. Sacrifice. Many seem to desire to serve the Lord with the littlest cost to them. 
It's been said, he who has a faith that costs nothing has a faith that is worth nothing. David didn't have that kind of faith. He says, nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with that which costs me nothing. Sacrifice is part of your offering. There's a, a fellow by the name of Barna who does polls, and uh, he's a pollster who polled the church in terms of, of the attitude of giving for uh, what you call evangelical believers. And in his recent poll, he pointed out that 9% of evangelical believers give to the Lord. And that means that believers normally are more generous to waitresses than they are to their God. And so Barna was pointing that out. In the Christian life, we don't give to God when we can afford it. In the Christian life, we give to God because it's an act of worship. We looked at the story of the widow uh, that brought her mites, her two mites that are found there in, in Mark 12. And Jesus used this woman as an example. You know, sometimes when we look at that, we think, well, she only gave two mites, you know, just a portion of a Roman soldier's daily wage. So that means you just give a little. That wasn't the point that Jesus was making. What Jesus was saying very simply is that these people have given out of their abundance. This woman gave out of her poverty. What he was commending was her faith because she gave all that she had to live on and that's what Jesus was commending. The amount was proportioned to what she had. Not in terms of the simple amount. Sometimes we think in terms of just a small amount therefore. No, that's not the point. Jesus wasn't commending that because the other people gave and they gave a tremendous amount. Jesus was saying others give out of their abundance. They've got so much that they just basically give God pocket change. This woman, on the other hand, he commends because she has a faith and a love to God to the point where she has sacrificially given to him all that she had to live on, and that's the point that Jesus makes. David is making that, that statement earlier on. David is saying, I'm not going to give to God something that doesn't cost me a thing. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to give to the Lord that which costs. It's a sacrifice, and that's part of my love for him. Now, in the time of the Apostle Paul, Jewish Christians were going through financial hardship. Upon becoming believers in Christ, many Jews were disinherited by their families and they became poor. And Paul was concerned about them and he encouraged financial aid to be sent to them so that they might be able to survive. He was so concerned that he actually wrote a letter to the Corinthians. It's found in 2 Corinthians as, as well as 1 Corinthians chapter 16 and, and 2 Corinthians chapters 8 and 9. And, and, and there he's speaking concerning the, the, the need that their impoverished brethren in, uh, in Jerusalem, uh, the need that they had, and, and he was encouraging the church to support and care for them. Now he speaks concerning the churches of Macedonia and he uses these churches as, as a, an example to encourage the Corinthians to follow that example. He, he was basically saying you need to imitate the faith that they've expressed. These churches of Macedonia, uh, the church of Thessalonica, Berea, and Philippi were helping and, and Paul is saying so you need to follow the example. And, and in 2 uh, Corinthians chapter 8 verses 1 through 5 this is what Paul writes. He says, brethren... We make known to you the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia that in a great trial of affliction the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded in the riches of their generosity. For I bear witness that according to their ability, yes, and beyond their ability, they were freely willing, imploring us with much urgency that we would receive the gift and the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And not only as we had hoped, but they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. Paul was speaking concerning the attitude of these believers. And he said that they were generous. He said that they gave beyond their ability. He said they were freely willing. They even asked us, they begged us to receive this gift because it was a fellowship in ministry serving the Lord as we serve these people. Now what's interesting beyond that is Paul makes the statement, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then to us by the will of God. These are good examples like the, the widow spoken of in Mark 12 and like David here in 2 Samuel of people who had given out of a generous sacrificial spirit. Giving is first to the Lord. And what happens here is these 
people first gave to the Lord. Their gifts were to God. But Paul makes this interesting statement because says, he says, first they gave themselves to the Lord and then they trusted me that I would dispose of their gifts in an honorable fashion. So in the giving, they first gave themselves to the Lord and then he said, to us by the will of God. In other words, they trusted that we would take care of the finances in a proper fashion. Just this last week, somebody had come into the office and I thought, well, I might as well address it because it's a fresh question, fresh concern. Somebody had come into the office and was uh, asking questions related to this kind of issue about giving and all of that. And, uh, and I thought that I would just say this to you. I don't do this very often. If you're a visitor here, I never, never, I never talk like this. There's no excuse to you. It's not an apology either. It's just an explanation. I don't do this. But I think it's necessary at this point, so I will. In our fellowship, because there are those people, you know, who, who wonder, how do I know that we can trust you? And, and I think that's a good question. I think you ought to. I think you ought to be wise in your stewardship. I have no problem with that. I think that it's a, I commend you for it. It's wise. Be wise in your giving. Just so that you know. We have an entire system of security here, financial security here. Nobody is left alone with any of the financial gifts ever. We have voluntarily, not because we have to, not because somebody told me to, not because the law requires. We voluntarily have yearly audits. I voluntarily do that. We pay a CPA to come here on a yearly basis. He's here for three days, sometimes longer. He goes through every book. He has all the financial records. He goes through it every year. He's been doing it for years. And as he goes through it, he looks and itemizes every nickel, dollar, every penny. Everything is kept in proper order. Everything. Then he gives to us his, his, um, the results of his audit. And then what he does is he makes recommendations so that we can remain current with the laws. That's what we do. We've been doing that for years. Not because I have to, but because I think it's the right thing to do. No cash goes unnoticed. No check goes unnoticed in this fellowship. I receive... Uh, weekly updates on offerings. I make decisions on most expenditures. I also deal with uh, requests that come in, but I don't know who gives here. I do not look into tithing records. I have no clue who gives and who doesn't give. That's not my business. It's not something I should be involved in. So I don't know who gives in this church or who doesn't. But I do know how the money is spent, and I do keep a close watch over it. That's a responsibility that God has given to me. I'm aware of those things. And I try to be as honest as I can, and I am honest, and thank God for that. But that's the truth. A long time ago, as a young believer, I, I read something that was asked of uh, Billy Graham. Billy Graham was asked, what will cause a minister to disqualify themselves from the ministry? And, and Billy said very quickly, he said, that's easy. He said, pride, women, or money. Those are the areas that a minister can fail in. Pride, women, or money. I don't do counseling with women. I'm never in my office alone with women. My door is always open. So anybody who walks by can look into my office and see me if they want any of my staff, but you'll never see me in there counseling with women. I don't counsel with women in this fellowship. On occasion, I have women asking, can I meet with you? And the answer is, we have ladies who have been trained to bring biblical guidance to other ladies. I will minister down here. I minister to, to women often. It's always in the open. I'm never alone with women. Not because I'm Mr. Lust Bucket and I'm afraid I'm going to fall, by the way. But because I want wisdom and I want to have an honorable uh, reputation. You know, when it comes to money, I'm not concerned about money at all. That's not one of the things that concerns me. You know, I just, I just don't have that. That's not one of the things that, that I'm concerned about. I'm aware of, of the fact that I could be greedy and therefore I die to any of those things. That's just something. And pride is something I have to deal with because I'm not looking forward to coming up here on Wednesday with a Band-Aid in my nose, even if it is, you know, a Spider-Man Band-Aid. You know, but that's something I have to deal with. Bottom line is, is, some people need to hear what I'm saying right now. And the bottom line is, is we take care of the finances here because they belong to God. And when the Apostle Paul was telling the, uh, the Corinthians, he said, you first gave yourself to God and then you gave yourself to us. And you knew that we would dispose of your gifts in an honorable fashion. And we can say the same thing to you from this pulpit. The same thing. The Lord, we fear God here. We fear God. 
and, and, and a long time ago, I, I began to seek the Lord and I asked God, help me to never disqualify myself. Because as I said earlier, if David Rosales falls, not only do I fall, but I affect Marie, I affect my children, I affect my grandchildren, I affect this church, I affect the church at large. I'm not going to fall with God's help. And that's what we do here. I want you to know that. Because those questions come up every once in a while and it's time for me to share. There is one thing though that we see with David. Well, I want to point this out as I'm about to close. Giving is sacrificial. And we should never offer God something that has no value. It's like that old story of that farmer who had a cow that birthed two calves. Twin calves. He came into the house and he says to his wife, Honey, uh, we just had two calves uh, birthed and they're twins. And, and, and I decided to give one to the Lord. And, and his wife says, And which one are you going to give? And he says, I haven't decided yet, but I'm giving one to the Lord. And she says, That's good. And, and then a couple hours later he walks in and he's all sad and she looks at his face and says what's wrong and he says the Lord's calf just died well there are people who actually do that you know they actually do that well you know I'll keep the living one I'll just give him the dead one and that does, that's not how it works it's like that, that little boy who went to church and his mother gave him a dollar and gave him a quarter and said give the dollar to the Lord and, give a, and keep the quarter for yourself and, and, and he comes home after church and she's doing the wash she puts her hand in the pocket and finds a dollar there and she says I told you to give uh, the dollar to the Lord and the quarter you were to keep for yourself he said yeah but the preacher said the Lord loves a cheerful giver and I was more cheerful giving the quarter than the dollar <laughs> and so there are people like that you know, and the bottom line is, is if it doesn't cost, what's it worth? What's it worth? We give more to Starbucks than we do, do to Jesus Christ. What's it worth? What's our sacrifice worth? You see what I'm saying? And, and David says, I, I, I'm not going to offer God anything that costs me nothing. Because sacrifice is an, an indication that I love the Lord and I'm grateful what God has done. He was a grateful giver. He'd been forgiven much. So he loved much. And he gave a sincere sacrifice. And God received it. And God heeded his prayer. Notice it says in verse 25, David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord heeded the prayers for the land. And the plague was withdrawn from Israel. I can't help but wonder what would happen if our nation, the nation that we have, how it would be affected if believers were actually sacrificial in our giving. I wonder what would happen. And churches would be able to reach out more and more. I have friends who've had to release people from staff, cut down programs, because the church is afraid. People are afraid to support the ministry. And it runs on three cylinders because the church isn't trusting the Lord and doesn't have an eternal framework and haven't come to understand what sacrifice means. Haven't really looked at the widow and her mites. Haven't really considered David's words. Haven't really thought about the Macedonian church as much because it may mean that I can't get things that I want or do things that I'd like to do. So the first thing that happens is the vacation comes and we stop giving to the Lord so we can go on our vacation. It's just wrong. And David says, I'm not going to give to the Lord that which costs me nothing. And what did God do? God stopped the plague. He honored him. He received it. I can't help but believe if the church in the United States were to begin to understand these kinds of things you'd see a whole lot more people getting saved because it's been said and I think rightly so a man's heart has a chain that is attached to his wallet and when God gets hold of the wallet that's because he got hold of the heart but he never will have the finances of a person until he has the heart of that person and when that person begins to realize that part of my service to the Lord will always be faithful sacrifice. When we finally understand that, you start seeing things happening in the kingdom of God because we finally woke up to the lesson that David tried to teach us all these years ago.